I'm actually going to talk about um, what, what it's like to do a startup in the chip business um, over the last 10 years, and then maybe a little bit about how it feels, uh, how those projects are going to do for the next uh, few years. So, um, so I'm going to launch into um, I'm going to launch into basically just an overview of the chip business, and then I'm going to look specifically at uh, at the company that we just did. Um, so, but just my own background. So, I, I, I actually, it turns out I've been in, kind of involved in the chip business now for 15 years. It doesn't seem that long. When yeah, actually, one of the first guys I met was John, who's in the room here, who did the Element 14 deal with us. But that was back in '97. I joined this company called Acorn. Then we spun out this company called Element 14 with about 35 people. Um, it took us, I think it was about 13 months from VC funding to selling it to Broadcom. Um, and about 16 months from closing the Series A round to actually closing the sale of the company for 640 million, uh, which is, I mean is ridiculous, obviously. Um, but uh, we'd grown the company to 75 people by that point. The Broadcom went on and they've built that business. It's actually the biggest player in the DSL market, which is a kind of uh, the fixed line broadband market. So I had a kind of decision to make at that point: do I do, I do another one or do I come a VC? And one of the other guys in the audience, Robin basically said, no, you, you, we need some more startup companies. Why don't you do another company, basically? Don't become a VC. So, so, so I took his advice, and we did this company called uh, Isira. So we fa founded this company. Actually, that took a bit longer, that business. Uh, it took us about 10 years to build that business. Built this to about 300 people. Uh, and then last year, we sold that business to NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is the leader in graphics chip companies. You probably see it on your PC logo. It's providing the graphics chip within there. And we're the first business that they've bought outside the graphics business. And we're a, you know, basically a communications chip company. We do the technology that goes in 3G phones. We do the communications piece of that. Um, and uh, so I'm now basically running a division of NVIDIA responsible for that uh, mobile communications technology. And actually, uh, there's another guy in the audience, George, who was at uh, Benchmark Capital. They basically funded our business um, you know, from the Series A round all the way through to the Series yeah, double E, I think we ended up at, but the time we actually sold the business. Um. Okay, so I thought I'd start with what's the big picture in the chip business, because at the surface it actually looks pretty benign. Um, but actually, under the surface, it's maybe not so benign. Uh, so let me just start with the big picture. So it's a growing, stable business. Yeah, so it's a $324 billion business. Uh, it's growing at a nice, you know, it's a slightly choppy, but it's growing at like 3.3% compo-downy growth rate. So the water's nice and warm. You know, you know, th this is a very safe, easy to predict long-term business. Um, so it looks great, actually, this, uh, this market. And, and, and from the downturn in 2009, we, we, the, business, the whole market's grown from 230 billion to 324 billion just in the last uh, two, three years. So we're in kind of a boom, really, for the chip business uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and within that, obviously, there's lots of different sectors. So there's actually quite a lot of churn beneath what looks like a smooth path. And underneath that, there are some uh, lines of business that are growing incredibly quickly. The one we've been involved with is the 3G cell phone market. Um, and now that's obviously what we're now seeing is the 4G, the LTE cell phone market. We do the modem technology that goes in there. And that particular market, just in the last few years, has gone from 175 million handsets sold globally to 742 million. Um, so, so that's pretty, pretty spectacular growth. Um, so, the, so not only is this a benign superstructure, but within it, you've got some really zippy bits uh, of, the, of the industry. So that compound annual growth rate is 33% in that period of time. So, so it's surely doing a startup business is easy then. You've just got to analyze the business, find out which sectors are growing, find some engineers, some bright engineers, you know, raise some capital, point it at a problem, and the time to go from that to Ferraris should be pretty short. Um, so what are we, why is it, why are we making it all sound so complicated? Um, um, so one of the things that's going on though is that um, the investment, in fact, what it really means is that the total amount of solution that you have to deliver to win any of that business is actually getting bigger. The, the, the whole product that has to be delivered is, in, is growing. It, it's less possible now to sell a piece of the solution. You actually have to sell pretty much the whole solution. Um, and that's, you can see that in the amount of R&D 
that large, what we call fabulous chip companies, so yeah, basically chip companies that haven't built a foundry but use third-party foundries to make their chips, which is the, the, the fastest growing model in the chip business. Um, and their R&D has gone from about 15 billion back in 2001 uh, and last, uh, actually 2010 is the last data I've got, it's gone up since, was over 100 billion. So that there's, that, that there's obviously a, a massive increase in the investment that's going into developing these platforms and these chips uh, that uh, a startup is going to have to figure out how to compete with. Um, and there's another problem as well. So as well as the growth in these number of 3G unit sales, which has gone from 175 million to 742, same numbers as before, there's another phenomenon, which is massive deflation in this business. Um, so we've gone from a chip price, and these are real chip prices, real selling prices of 3G chipsets, gone from $13.50 for two chips um, to $4 for two chips. Um, at the same time as the data rate has gone from 3.6 megabits per second to 21 megabits per second. Um, so we've got yeah, 7x the data rate, and the price we get for it is a third. Um, so that's pretty deflationary. Um, and in fact, if you multiply those numbers together, the actual growth, even on that growth segment in dollar terms, is actually not very much. It's, it's about 5 or 6% compound annual growth rate. So you have to run incredibly hard to get in this business. So you've got massive investment, huge deflation, and, and, uh, and you know, these are all spelling uh, actually a fairly, what looked like a benign business is actually a pretty hostile cocktail of uh, factors here. Um, so, um, and, and to add to those woes, and I'll come on to what we did in a second, um, you know, there's another phenomenon, um, which is that the dominant players in a particular segment are absolutely exercising their muscle with customers. Um, and you can look at that in looking at the revenue that those companies, the revenue growth that those companies uh, uh, showed in, in 2011. So, yeah, and there's three companies stand out here as, as showing yeah, high top-line growth from year to year. Intel, and not surprisingly, the dominant market player in the PC business, is squeezing everybody else out of that business as quickly as they can through a variety of techniques, uh, discounts, rebates, threats. Um, um, the same is true of a company we know fairly well, who's our direct competitor in the mobile space, Qualcomm is yeah, yeah, somewhat famous. If you want to read our complaint to the European Commission, you can read the detail. Famous for basically anti-competitive business practices to uh, cause customers to, uh, to buy their stuff from nobody else's. And then, and then in, the, in, the, in the wireless space, yeah, Broadcom has a, a dominant market position in Wi-Fi, one of the major players in the Wi-Fi space. Those guys are seeing growth in those segments. And the others, as you can see, actually are declining in what is a growing market. Um, so there's, 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 there's lots of muscle brought to bear here. So. And, and so you put all those factors together, they're actually pretty hostile to the startup business. The dollars that have to go into a venture firm are going up. The, the, the dominant pressures of the incumbents are, are being exercised. And there's massive deflation. Um, and, and, and as the, idea, uh, the, the fabulous investment goes up, the amount of VC investment in semiconductors is almost a, almost a mirror image of that, really. Um, so we've gone from $3.5 billion invested in chip companies in 2000, uh, the year 2000. Uh, we're now about a billion dollars, really. So that's yeah, roughly a 70% reduction in investment in the chip business. Uh, and in fact, it's become so difficult to start a chip business that the total number of chip, yes, if you measure chip startups by Series A rounds, the total number of Series A rounds has gone from about 50, uh, over 50 in the 2000-2001 space. This year, the total number of globally Series A rounds that we've done in the chip business is one. Um, and last year, it was three. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so the chip business is, is in a pretty interesting state right now in terms of yeah, the, the overall uh, factors in this market. So that's, that's my background on this uh, industry. Um, okay, so what's our story the last 10 years uh, in this business? Um, so, so we started this company um, in April 2002, uh, four people, uh, raised our first round in January 2003. Um, and what I'm showing on here are two, two lines, really. One is the, the capital that we raised is this, this line in red, and then the green is the, 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 uh, the, yeah, the post-money value. 
on which, uh, on which that money was based. So you can see there's a fairly sort of normal startup. We actually decided we we're going to do what was called the baseband chips as the digital chip and the software, the initial software, the, the what's called the file layer software that runs on that. And then all the other pieces of a solution we're going to get from somebody else. So we're going to get the, uh, a big chunk of software called the protocol stack. We're going to get from a company called TDPcom, actually in Cambridge, and the radio chip we're going to get from a, a German company, Infineon. Uh, so we're going to do those two things. We raised, uh, we raised basically about 50 million, and the post money on that was about, eight, uh, about 80 or something. So that's, that's how, it, so it looks fairly traditional at this point, 42, sorry, 42.7 million. Um, so we then decided that, you know, we, we actually had to provide the whole solution. We couldn't sell just a piece of the solution. We had to deliver the whole thing. So we had to embrace doing the protocol stack and embrace also, actually we bought a, a radio company, a transceiver company, this RF company, and we put our own product number on that. And we also had to do some more air interfaces, 2G as well as 3G. So the whole problem just got bigger. And in fact, we, we ended up raising um, another roughly $100 million. Um, so we'd raised $143 million. But it actually, it was looking OK. Uh, you can get a slight sense of what's happening. My, my, uh, we got, we, things were kind of looking OK here because the value is actually going up. Um, and in fact, yeah, we, we actually closed the last round of funding pre-crisis Post money was about $350 million. So, yeah, it actually looking pretty good. We're looking like an outlier, in fact, in terms of the valuation that we're getting for this company. Um, and uh, we were clearly aiming at a kind of billion dollar IPO at that point. Ouch. Um, yeah, so, September 2008, uh, Sequoia Capital you know, basically sent out a memo to the industry, really, but to all their CEOs called RIP Good Times. I don't know if anybody ever saw that. And it, the message was, you know, yeah, whatever capital you've got, it's the last you're going to get. If you want to raise any more capital, your price for doing that is cutting costs. Um, and um, you know, demand is going to be low from now on. Um, VCs are not going to raise any more money. Um, and the world is ending, basically. Um, and uh, and yeah, we, we unfortunately had a burn rate like a furnace at this point, as you could imagine. And uh, so we were reading this thing, oh, shit. <laughs> so so, uh, so we, we, we managed to basically, um, you know, the skin of our teeth, really, persuade our VCs that rather than let the company burn, that, that it is worth their while putting new money in behind what they'd already invested and we do it at a significant down round. So we ended up with a fairly painful down round. And we also had to take 25% out of our cost base. So we did a massive riff across the company and took a huge chunk of cost out, which is quite difficult in this market, which is competitive for R&D, as you can imagine. So, so this is what, what you know, our, our post money ended up being about 100 million. But we did manage to raise uh, some additional money to keep the company going. And then really from then, Every dollar we raised, we raised at the same price per share. So the value just went up by the amount of cash that we raised the post money. Uh, and in the end, it took us still 100 million to get from crisis to the point where we, you know, we could actually sell the business. Um, and, uh, and so we raised in total 245 million. And, uh, and we ended up you know, you know, going to another process node to 40 nanometers to adding LTE, the fourth generation solution on there, uh, you know, spin our transceiver chip and so on. So these are pretty expensive things to do. And in the end, we sold the business to NVIDIA for 367 million, uh, which is you know, roughly yeah, about 1.5x the money that we'd actually raised in the business. Um, so yeah, obviously some of that uh, money is due to employees and to, and to managers. So the VC return on that is probably more like yeah, 1.3x or 1.2x. Um, so not a fantastic return, but we've sailed the ship back to port safely and uh, the VCs got their money back with a return at least. Um, so. Um, so that's, that was our, our kind of experience on this. And actually, I, I gave this slide presentation at a semiconductor presentation two weeks ago. And I think every chip company that was shown as a success in the last couple of years had almost exactly the same experience, basically, in terms of even the amount of money that they raised and the resets that they'd had was, was almost identical. And those were the successes. Um, so I think the things we managed to get right is that we, we did manage to select the growing standard. Yeah, we did manage to buy some R&D for very low dollars. Yeah, we bought the entire protocol stack, which they probably spent $250 million on. We paid about $5 million for that. 
and we bought a transceiver company that had 65 million of venture money. We paid about 5 million for that as well. Um, we, we did get some help from the power brokers in our industry. That's the network operators, uh, it's particularly Vodafone and AT&T. We, we managed to align with our investors in tough, tough times. I mean, they, we kept their trust. They gave us continued control of the business. And, uh, and we, we, I think we managed to balance our ambition still with honesty about the situation. Um, and I think we eventually, when we sold the company, we did manage to articulate the vision of why NVIDIA and ICERA together would be a winning combination um, and managed to uh, uh, put that deal together. Okay, so, so that, that's, a sort of, that's a big chip investment. Um, yeah, you couldn't do that deal today, uh, nor would you necessarily want to do that deal today. Um, but what's next for the chip industry? Well, I think the thing that's interesting is that the total number of private semiconductor M&A deals, in other words, deals that chip companies are doing to buy private assets, is actually remaining fairly constant. Um, so those could be divisions that they're buying, there could be uh, acquisitions of existing companies that uh, exist, but, it, but it's not really diminishing. Uh, and that's because big companies are actually quite bad at innovation, and they are relying on a conveyor belt of private companies that can bring that innovation to them. But as you can see, the supply of those companies is getting drained quite seriously now. Um, so, so there is a gap opening up here, which you know, I think is quite interesting, um, and it is gradually, I think, going to uh, spawn a, a kind of next generation of companies. And I think a big slice of that is probably going to be in the mixed signal and power management domain rather than the big digital chip domain. Um, so if I actually look at, th this is a phone that's just about to launch, it's a 2012 smartphone, it happens to have our technology in it, so um, these are the chips that we're doing inside NVIDIA, so we're doing application processor, baseband processor, transceiver chip, which are the three key chips in the system. Um, but there's a load of other chips in there as well, there's some memory, obviously we're not doing that. Uh, there's some connectivity, so there's non-cellular sort of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS connectivity. Um, and then there's a bunch of power management, mixed signal and sensor chips in there. And then there's a bunch of RF components in there as well. So there's, there's a lot of other chips, apart from these big expensive chips that go in a cell phone, that have to be developed and have to be uh, engineered, which represents uh, opportunity, I think. And the amount of investment to do those deals, I think, is a lot less than doing sort of big chip companies with, with a ton of software. Um, and a good example of a company that is leveraging that um, is actually a public company, as it turns out, called Dialog Semiconductor. And so Dialog are not able to say this publicly, but their power management chips goes in the Apple iPhone um, and, uh, and, and in a bunch of other phones and technology as well. And they've seen this phenomenal growth in revenue. They, they focused on doing power management, uh, sensor, uh, audio and display driver chips, and their revenues have gone from about 80 million to about 530 million. So it's a, it's a UK domicile company, UK and Germany. Um, and yeah, you've seen that business go from a, a, a loss to a, a pretty healthy profit uh, after, after having charged increasing amounts of R&D to that. Um, so they're, they're, I mean, they're spending about 90 million a year now on R&D. That's gone from 42 to 56 to 90 over the last three years. And I think it's a, it's a sign that, you know, that there is growth in the chip business. It can be done at sensible dollar investment numbers. It's just probably not in the big digital chip with all this software because uh, that's just become a bit outside the range of uh, venture. So I think the summary is that, um, that I say the digital domain's insanely capital intensive. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the argument I'm making is that the VC industry has swung too far the other way. There are no deals getting done in the semiconductor space now. And, and actually, that, that can't be right. Um, yeah, the, the, there is a gap opening up here. Um, yeah, I think the return on those kind of investments will be solid and actually lower risk. Um, and I think we're going to see a resurgence of startups in that space. So, so that was, uh, and that is pretty much all I've got, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm helping to get us back on schedule. So.